progress was European oriented, dominated by Britain and the US. Britain only acquired um, the Falkland Islands, which is Las Malvinas, this is nearby Argentina. And they just got it because they wanted to have um, financial expansion in Latin America. They already had colonies, so they're not interested in colonizing that area, but they wanted to have a financial expansion, you know, increase their trade or investment in Latin America. So they already had colonies in South Africa, India, Australia, Canada, and Jamaica, but to take over the Falkland Islands, which are the Malvinas. And Britain was the center of progress and civilization, and France was the ideal of literary and artistic culture and fashion. So the, the Las Islas Malvinas nearby Argentina, as you can see here in the map, is still part of uh, England. It's over here, Las Malvinas, and it's a British island. You can see, look at the architecture. And nearby the south is really cold, so you can find ice and penguins. Uh, U.S. influence in Latin America began to overtake British influence only in the 1890s. So uh, British were the most powerful and starting from the 1890s, the U.S. will become very powerful in Latin America. U.S. had been mostly inward until 1890s. The U.S. suffered the worst depression in its 100-year history. The U.S. factories had outrun the internal demand for the U.S. products, so they had too much production, and the U.S. what um, already had all the consumptions they had leftovers. So they would have to export the manufactured goods, and they they're looking to ex expand um, in exports. So the U.S. National Association of Manufacturers was formed to search for market abroad, markets abroad, especially in Latin America and Asia. So the naval strategist Alfred Thayer Mahan wrote about a need for a transoceanic canal linking the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. And in 1896, U.S. presidential, presidential campaign, the Republican Party called for a canal uh, and the annexation of uh, the Hawaiian Islands and the intervention in Cuba, as it will happen later on. Uh, the U.S. will get into war with Spain, and they will end up taking over Cuba, Puerto Rico, and also the Philippines. In 1898, the U.S. declared war on Spain and invaded Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. The war lasted a few weeks, they say and they were able to get the Spanish out of those countries. The Cuban rebellion had been organized by Cuban exiles in New York, and the U.S. took over the islands from Spain. And Cuba will remain under the pro protectorate of the U.S. for 35 years. The Philippines, viewed as a commercial gateway to Asia, remember they wanted to expand to Asia and Latin America, were governed directly by the U.S. until the 1940s. So you can see they were in Cuba and they were also in the Philippines, the U.S., for many years. And the Hawaiian Islands were annexed into the United States in 1898 and they also take over Puerto Rico in 1898, which is permanently colonized and now it's a commonwealth of the United States. In 1903, President uh, Theodore Roosevelt um, acquired a U.S. base along with the rights to build a control um, the canal in Panama. The Cana Panama can Canal will be built because of the U.S. So Panama had been part of Colombia and Roosevelt helps separate Panama from Colombia obviously because they want them to be weaker and they bought the rights um, you know from the new Panamanian government days later to be able to build this canal and the deal was conducted without any native Panamanians present just the government and the US huh? and many people in the United States saw US triumphs as preordained by racial and cultural superiority they believe they are superior in race, so they're able to take over those places and have U.S. triumph, triumphs. And you will see 
They were going to many Latin American countries and tried to control it. The U.S. gradually overthrows uh, England in dominance and diplomacy, diplomacy and Latin America, um, you know, takes control of Latin America and it was completed, they say, by World War I. Be, that happened between 1914 to 1918. Argentina was the last one that remained influential by Britain. And the ideas of racial uh, inferiority of indigenous, mestizo, black Latin Americans uh, combined with the old Protestant prejudices against the Catholic Spain that you have in here. In 1905, Theodore Roosevelt provided the Monroe Doctrine with a corollary. The Roosevelt Corollary basically made the U.S. Marine a police force to prevent from European military intervention in America, meaning that the Europe cannot bring the military and take over Latin America. So they're um, keeping the Europeans out of Latin America by having the Roosevelt Corollary. And by 1929, 40% of all U.S. international investments were in Latin America. The U.S. diplomats had created the Pan American Union. It was an organization based on ideals of free trade, right? And composed of Latin American ambassadors and U.S. Uh, you know, secretaries of state. You know, and it was meeting in Washington, D.C. The U.S. secretaries, they promoted trade. They wanted free trade with Latin America. And Latin America representatives were very concerned with all the U.S. interventions in the regions. The protest came to the head of Havana Conference in 1928. And you will see the U.S. interventions in Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Panama. A U.S. soldiers had occupied Nicaragua during this time between 1912 to 1933, Haiti 1915 to 1934, and the Dominican Republic 1916 to 1924. So the U.S. really wants to expand its influence and its trade in Latin America during this time. By the late 1920s, the U.S. Marines were in a five-year shooting war in the Nicaraguan Patriot guerrillas. The guerrilla leader was Augusto Cesar Sandino, accused U.S. of imperialism. So Sandino was against the U.S. And several of the U.S. interventions installed leaders, dictators, obedient to U.S. policies, and they would start civil wars in there. Um, one is backed by the U.S. and I guess the other side will be the anti-U.S. Uh, writers start writing against the U.S. You will see the Nicaraguan poet Ruben Darío uh, against, you know, he talks about the godless Roosevelt. And the Cuban poet Jose Martí began a literary movement in defense of Nuestra America. And, you know, Uruguayan essayist uh, Jose Enrique Rodó, whose book Ariel, uh, uh, Rodó, wrote in 1900 and he respected the u.s but found it its utilitarian value foreign alien he accused the u.s culture of materialism and challenged latin americans to cultivate uh finer things personified by the spirit of ariel in this book so um they all question the logic of neocolonialism so there are people in these countries who are for the U.S. and against the U.S. Um, moving pictures started arriving in Latin America, the silent films from Hollywood in the 1890s. And they were watching all these movies during this time from Hollywood. By the 1920s, a tide of nationalism rose in country after country against neocolonialism, the system that only a few landowners, foreign investors, and middle class profited, while many normal, ordinary Latin Americans were suffering. Uh, the neocolonial mold shattered by the New York stock market that collapsed in 1929 uh, into decades of depression and war in the U.S. Okay, so the U.S. becomes weaker and they will start losing that also in Latin America becoming a little weaker because they can't focus so much on this side. 
So the uh, demand for export for Latin America dropped dramatically and the nationalists started bringing down oligarchies and liberal dictators. And you see there'll be a wave of nationalists taking over the government uh, after this. So we'll talk about that in chapter eight. That's it for now. Bye.